your space is your most important piece of gear. So the actual walls, the ceiling, mm. the floor, that's, that's, that's a, a piece point, of yeah. gear. And that that's has a, a sound to it, just like a microphone has a sound. Well, uh, before we keep on talking about gear, uh, I just want to first of all say thank you so much for taking the time out to do this. I mean, I, I, I did a podcast with another studio owner about a week or two ago. Really cool guy uh, from, from Mumbai in India. Uh, has this really, really beautiful studio called Island City Studio. And we were just talking about, you know, studio ownership and gear and, you know, crazy experiments and all of that kind of stuff. So I want to first premise this entire sort of podcast with just saying that um, Ryan is like, I mean, I've watched so many of those videos uh, of like trying cool and new things. Like I remember watching some of your videos and it reminded me why I like audio engineering in the first place. So um, I specifically remember the, um, you had done something really cool with a garden hose and creating a reverb sound out of drums, uh, which is a super fun video. And I had never thought of doing anything like that. And I was like, well, I have a studio. Hmm, let me try doing that too. And it got really interesting results. So uh, I just want to say uh, thank you again so much for taking the time out for this. Um, go check out his channel. It's super cool. Just tons and tons of information about really fun stuff to do in a studio and mics and gear. So um, thanks again for that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thanks for having me. This is really cool to talk to you. And uh, man, I'm just honored. I mean, yeah, like I, I kind of just make videos that seem cool and, and that might kind of be entertaining for myself and be like, what what would I like? And and uh, the fact that other people like the videos too, I think it's it's great, you know? And mm -hmm. I just try to bring people along for the ride, you know? I say, well, I, I think I wanna kind of experiment with this and then let people kind of see what I'm, what I'm doing for that week. So yeah, it's been a lot of fun is over that, the past couple of years. Is that how you, I mean, is that how you started? Uh, in the sense that like, was it always this this YouTube channel, uh, Creator Sound Lab, Sound Lab TV, like, did it start with the intention of just being like, let's experiment with different kind of ideas and techniques, or did it start purely as an educational platform to be like, oh, here's how you mic a drum kit, or here's how you can mic a guitar cap? Like, what, what was the genesis story? It's a really good question because I I realized that I was actually doing like little articles and little like blog posts about different recording techniques. And, um, you know, I, I don't exactly know who I was writing those for. Like, I, I don't know what was going through my mind, but, but I just knew that I was like, maybe writing, you know, these little articles for whoever might come upon them. And um, that was just for like the studio's website at the time. And, mm -hmm. uh, but then later I was like, well, you know, I, I really wanted to do a course and, but I, you know, I'm not really like an instructor. And so I need to start actually just like teaching people stuff because, uh, you know, who am I to have make a course if I'm not actually teaching people stuff? Absolutely. So then I'm like, yeah, well, yeah. let's start making YouTube videos. And so I just started with stuff that I loved, you know, like my very first video was, um, Kind of the the ratio of the room sound to direct sound and i just showed a mic like you know getting kind of further and further away from a drum kit and super simple but you know just kind of a basics of engineering and essentially it was a wet and dry of reverb versus direct drum sound and we mm. were doing it with a microphone instead and so it was kind of that uh that introduction as well where you're blending the worlds between mixing and recording because you're starting to make mixed decisions as you're setting up those mics. And so I really tried to present all these concepts with that in mind that um, there's kind of an, an overview mindset or a, a theory of how I'm approaching this. And that's all these, uh, all these techniques are kind of intertwined and there's there's no real like stop to the recording and then start to the mixing but instead you're starting the mixing decisions when you set up the drum kit in the process of recording yeah. yeah and then when you mix sometimes you even reamp so now you're back in recording world so 
um, yeah, I, I just started making videos that, that I thought were cool. And I did that for, I mean, I kind of like just made videos for an empty room for a while because it's like, you know, <laughs> like whatever, like it's going to take a while to build an audience and mm. I have to do it for me. So I'm just going to like try to do one a week and, and just do it for the five people that watch my videos. <laughs> and um, to be honest, like it's actually best to think of it that way as those same five people. Because the hardest time I ever have making videos is when I have a really big video and I'm like, oh my gosh, like, how am I going to beat that? You know, like, <laughs> there's going to be a lot of people like watching this and it, I start to overthink it. So, yeah, I mean, to this day, I try to get back to that like first year version of myself where I'm just making videos for myself. What I think is cool, that's kind of my filter and try to picture when I talk to the camera of, you know, like my fans that are just really fun to comment with, you know, below the videos. I try to just talk to those people that comment all the time. Yeah, there's always like a discourse happening in every video, just in the comment sections about, oh, try this as well. And you, I, I mean, I've seen a lot of suggestions from people being like, oh, Ryan, why don't you try this out? Why don't you try that out? I think yeah, one in question I really wanted to ask you is that well, part of it is experimentation, part of it is trying something new, but part of it is is coming from a position of knowledge and understanding about rooms and acoustics and miking techniques and stuff like that. So, what were your like? What was your background? I mean, did you come from an audio engineering background? Did you discover this on your on your own? Did you have you know reference materials that you're like, oh, I read those two books and that really helped me out. What was what are those sort of references of yours? Yeah, so um, I started out as a drummer, and I I really just kind of dove right in uh, as a kid, and I played. Uh, you know, when my parents got me a drum set, I played I think eight to ten hours that day. I mean, I just totally dove straight in, and so I, I learned very quickly. Uh, how I how I enjoy exploring new concepts and learning, and uh, I really enjoy uh, learning on my own and just diving in and and uh, just getting lost in it. And so started out as a drummer. Um, maybe f five six years later, in kind of late high school, I got uh, a couple mics and kind of experimented with miking up my drum set because having mics on a kit was really cool you know it made you feel important if you if you don't have a mic on your tom you know at a gig it's like well is that not important like why'd i bring it you know <laughs> so you know it makes you feel important to have mics and i'm like this is cool i want mics on my kit you know like it makes me legit so i want mics mm -hmm. you know so yeah like uh i started doing recordings and i had a little um I had a fire pod by Presonus, and um, I recorded to um, Cool Edit Pro, um, and that's since become Audition um, with Adobe. Uh, mm -hmm. But then, you know, as time went on, uh, I kept kind of goofing off with little recordings of the drums, and I eventually started to do uh, more programming stuff. And that was with Propel uh, Propeller Head's Reason. Mm -hmm. And then from mm -hmm. there, it was Ableton Live. And eventually, this is kind of like, you know, all the stuff I was kind of going on and playing around with. Eventually, my break into pro audio was when I, I had a friend who wanted to set up a studio, but he didn't have a space to do it. I had the space to do it. And then we had a mutual friend that had a bunch of studio gear and kind of wanted it out of the house because mm -hmm. they were having a baby or something. So between the three of us, we had a studio and it ended up mm -hmm. being right in my garage. We renovated this uh, garage. That was kind of my, my big break into pro audio to really experiment with recording vocals, recording guitar cabinets, um, recording acoustic guitar. You know, I, I'd never really done those things, but my strength was is that I uh, I'd pretty much known how to record a drum set. So I had the hard yeah. thing out of the yeah. way. It was just learning how to record vocals and 
uh, acoustic guitar and piano. I mean, like all those other things. And so for me, it was just kind of filling in the gaps from there. With that knowledge, with that kind of introduction into the pro audio world, you know, with the studio in my house, I eventually saw um, some videos by Weathervane Music and really liked kind of the style of how they recorded. And it was very different from what I knew. And it was more open rooms with the drums, open room with guitar cabinets, um, no need for vocal booths even. And mm -hmm. they would just record their vocals in the main room, you know, and uh, maybe some padded blankets around the vocalist at, at most. And so that's when I really solidified, okay, that's the sound that I want. That's really the type of engineering I want to do. Um, so yeah, that's the progression from the very beginning all the way to kind of where I'm at now, where very hands-on engineering, hands-on mixing, um, creative sounds, yeah, fun with yeah. audio. Is that what your studio is called as well? My studio, uh, it was started about 10 years ago and I gave it the name uh, Lumen Audio. I see. But I've I've actually been wanting to change the name just to Creative Sound Lab because um, it, it just doesn't make any sense anymore, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, this is Creative Sound Lab, so yeah. Oh, that's 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 super cool. And in terms of um, like just going back to like you know reference material, like you you mentioned a couple of YouTube videos that that really helped you sort of get on your way. Um, did you did you have any texts that you referred to when you were starting out, or uh, or was it just hey let's just try this out? Um, I'm curious about that because I remember when um, when I first started out, like I didn't have I mean I didn't come from a audio engineering background either, and um, I'm a guitarist, and I kind of had the same sort of you know initiation as you did. I was like hey I want to record guitar, so my very first interface was a um, Focusrite. Scarlet first generation way back in the day and uh, I didn't know anything about DI recording I mean I didn't know anything about recording quite frankly and I remember my friend who was an audio engineer he gave me um he gave me a PDF um the recording engineer's handbook um by by Bobby I'll I'll try to remember that and put it in the link but by Bobby something oh, yeah. I can't remember what um, and Alinsky you know I what think. I'm talking about yeah uh huh and I remember, like, I mean, I didn't, I obviously didn't go through the whole thing the first time, but the very first few pages, there was this one quote that I, that read, um, uh, if you were to talk about breaking up what contributes to sound, he said that 50% of the sound is the instrument and the musician. It's all, I mean, it's slightly more and slightly less, but it's always the biggest chunk that contributes to the sound. It's the quality of the instrument and the quality of the musician. Then 20% of the sound is the room, 20% of the sound is uh, mic placement, and 10% of the sound is the choice of mic and cables and preamps and you know all the outboard gear. So for me, that was like great inspiration to be like, oh, well, I don't need to have the fanciest gear to like start off, you know? So did you have any material like that that you could refer to or like that gave you inspiration? Yeah, um, let's see here, I'm trying to, trying to really think, um, you know, I, I I think that there was so much that I learned just recording drums that I knew. I knew about the balance of moving a mic super close, like an overhead, super close versus far. So I knew I knew kind of about mic position. but I but I think that the the earliest inspiration for me was um, uh, definitely tape op magazine, um, you know, various articles uh, talking about reamping, you know, things of like, oh my gosh, I've never thought of that. Uh, this is amazing. Um, even sometimes uh, I would watch um, a video on a new like UAD plugin and they're so informative that I learned all about um, how, you know, Bill Putnam set up a, a uh, speaker in the bathroom and how, you know, if somebody flushed the toilet, th that toilet flush would be a part of the vocal reverb sound. And, you know, like, I was exposed to different information kind of in a a, a random way. Mm -hmm. um, but mm -hmm. when I when, when I caught hold of it, I'm like, oh, that's very cool. I got to learn more about that. 
um, the Yamaha Sound Reinforcement Handbook, um, the Audio uh, Cyclopedia, uh, gosh, Home Recording Handbook. Right. Um, yeah, there's there's several that mm-hmm. that I have. Um, I just took them down. I'm I'm trying to set up a a kind of a brainstorming desk at at my house, and I have kind of all my my materials there, and you know, concept brainstorming and outlining mm-hmm. of videos and stuff. So, been kind of taking stuff out of the studio and moving into the brainstorming room. Yeah, yeah, but um, yeah, I would say probably the biggest influence. Um, yeah, I mean, like I did a lot of online reading, you know, a lot of gear slits reading. Yeah, just trying mm-hmm. to figure out which way's up on gear, you know, what's the most popular thing. Um, that's where I learned about an SM7B, you know, like that's maybe a good mic to try. Yeah. You know, stuff yeah. like that is, you know, you do a lot of reading and you kind of catch what's the most popular thing. Right, speaking of gear, what in your studio and based on all the gear that you have, which you have a lot, this is going to be a tough one for you, but what would be your sort of favorite mic, favorite piece of output gear, um, favorite sort of amp, because you've got a bunch of vintage amps I've seen. So if you were to have, like, if you had to select just one, what, what would it be? Or top three, at least. I mean, no, no, that's too easy. Let's not do top three. Let's just do, <laughs> let's just do one. You know, actually, in in reality, it's not so tough. I, I would I would say it's got to be, it's got to be my R eighty eight ribbon mic, mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. I mean, with that mic, I've I've recorded drums. Um, within the first hour of a recording session, I was able to win over the client. They stopped worrying about the quality of the recording when they heard those drum tracks. You know, that made it so much easier to record drums because it just sounded great over a drum kit. Right. Then that same mic became an effect mic. So every everything else that we recorded, guitars, acoustics, whatever, I always had that just running, you know? So I had it up in the room. And so that mic allowed me to capture the room mm. and use basically real acoustics as... Uh, as an effect and it allowed me to build a three-dimensional space within a mix um and you know i even used it as individual channels too Mm -hmm. you know like you know just one side of it so yeah i mean if i had a favorite piece of gear and something that's been with me through thick and thin i'd say it's the r88 uh by aea and you know it's just Mm -hmm. it's such a great mic um it's very well balanced it's not too hyped it's a little dark, but, um, but yeah, it's got to be the R88. All right, R88. I mean, ribbons are always, I think, on the top of people's lists. Like either you know a 4038 or an R88, or you know, I mean, you'll always have ribbons on that list. I feel everyone I've spoken to, even though they have like you know like 87s and stuff, nobody selects that stuff. It always ends up being ribbons, which is. Which is always fascinating, I think. Um, outboard gear. Favorite for outboard gear? Mm-hmm. Mm. It could be pre's, compressors, EQs. Well, uh, yeah, I, I think it would definitely be a compressor. Um, man, you pick some hard questions. <laughs> You know, I, I gotta say that it's man. There's some really, there's some really good choices, but I would say it's got to be the fifty twenty stereo FET limiter by M House Studios. Right. You know, I don't know. This thing gets me so excited about sounds. Like, it's really aggressive. It's a stereo compressor, and it's designed to be very aggressive, very flavorful. Um, these, uh, I believe it's two guys, um, out of the Midwest and the United States, they, uh, they're just a couple of guys, uh, you know, like, like our age, and, uh, I went up to their booth at, at NAM, and, you know, it was, like, very, very simple booth, mm-hmm. and I just, I mm-hmm. loved the fact that it was, like, I don't know, so fresh, and even, like, understated, and was, like, 
you know, like, there could be something really cool here. And it sounded amazing. And they even teamed up with uh, Vance Powell and and had him kind of, like, give feedback and, you know, make revisions and stuff. It sounds great. I mean, it's almost like an 1176 on steroids mm -hmm. with, like, with like a, a bass boost mixed in because you get, like, a really thick low end somehow. Um yeah, it it is like the coolest sounding compressor um for drums uh that I've ever heard. I mean, it just sounds really really cool. Wow. All right. I got to check this out. I've never heard of this um this compressor before. And um I think it was amps, right? Cuz you've got a large boutique selection of amps. So Okay. Uh which actually, before you answer that, which is the oldest amp you have? Because you've got a bunch of vintage gear as well, right? Uh, I think the oldest amp that I have is uh, the Dyn Electro. Um, it's called a Leader LA75 by Dyn Electro. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a blonde color, and I believe it's from the 50s, perhaps. Um, has a really cool sound kind of swampy delta blues um distorted kind of sound um when you wow. push it really hard it it acts like it can't keep up and it kind of caves in like you're gonna break it <laughs> mm -hmm. and so i don't know like amp sounds so cool when you think it might catch on fire or it might right, break right. like yeah. almost the uh, like anxiousness of like oh my gosh that's such a cool sound uh on the precipice of disaster. Yeah, so I mean, it, it's, as far as like my absolute favorite amp, um, oh man. You know, I, I want to say the Gibson Scout. Uh -huh. um, it's got, it's got a, a really nice overdrive to it. Um, it used to have a, a different speaker in it and didn't sound right, but I found this Oxford speaker that I had. I don't know where I got it, but, um, I put an Oxford speaker in there, and it just pushed the speaker a lot harder. And it, it mm. had, like, this really cool, like, kind of gritty, sandy sound. Um, just just a, a really cool character. Um, so it's it sounds really cool as a distortion amp. But the cool thing about that is the tremolo. Uh, the Gibson Scout, it just has this amazing tremolo that's perfect for... Um, kind of like that Western, like, yeah, like kind of wavy, yeah. pushy with tremolo like heavy, with like a fairly wide depth and right, right. Yeah. It's like, it's like a really round sounding tremolo that, that doesn't sound harsh. Like some tremolos, it almost sounds like it's pulsating a little mm -hmm. bit. Mm -hmm. Uh, but the Gibson Scout, it just sounds just very smooth almost like you're just turning up the volume kind mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. um and then the reverb the the reverb to the gibson scout it uh it it keeps going even if you turn down the volume it just keeps sounding so you could actually run it as like a reverb um mm -hmm. it's not the most amazing sounding reverb i should probably maybe switch out the tank on it but yeah i mean that's such a cool little amp wow. all right um, next question, uh, and this is one that I, it's hard to ignore, obviously, but what was 2020 like? Um, you know, the pandemic, work, um, especially with something as capital intensive like a studio. Um, did you see a dip in work? Did you focus more on YouTube during the time? Uh, how did you, how did you make the most out of 2020? And like, um, what was the things that made you reevaluate, okay, you know, going forward, this is what's going to change. Yeah. You know, it it was different for me overall, but not that different. I guess I was fortunate that a lot of my business is online because I spend so much time and energy uh, making courses, making YouTube videos. So it really didn't change too much, a whole lot for me. Um, a lot of times I'll 
record, you know, I'll still record local bands here. Um, but for the most part, I try to flip the model a little bit where if I'm, if I know that I'm going to record content for like a paid course, then what I try to do is actually pay the band instead of them paying me for the recording. So right. I'm able to actually create a job for, you know, a day for a couple of musicians. And then, you know, the students of the course basically help to pay the band. So I've kind of flipped the model a little bit from just a traditional recording studio. And so, mm. like, for me, the biggest thing was, um, like, if I needed to demonstrate a vocal mic, I had a hard time, like, getting somebody to come, you know? Because um, they just don't want to come to a studio and hang out for an hour or two. Um, mm. I actually did have a recording uh, a recording project, and we just kind of just did it. I mean, it was kind of a risk, but um, we tried to stay as safe as possible. Um, but we, we all just kind of needed it for our sanity. I mean, like we had been locked up for a couple of months at that point and like a couple of the horn players were just happy to get out of their house. Like they were just like so thankful just to be a part of something and just to do something. And so for me going forward and what changed in 2020 is, is really just the emphasis of online stuff. Like... I mean, it really kind of affirmed everything of like, you know, Zoom meetings and online learning. And, you know, I even had a, a inquiry about course material for a more traditional, uh, you know, college, because I had spent all this time, years, you know, creating these courses and they didn't have anything, you know, mm -hmm. because they all of a sudden needed something to do online right. and... Um, right. So for them, they were having to make that shift very suddenly to online content and digital mm -hmm. content. Mm -hmm. And so if anything, it just kind of affirmed like, okay, like this is this is a great direction. Um, you know, uh, YouTube is amazing because you really can have an audience anywhere. Uh, I mean, really in any platform, but uh, you can have an audience anywhere. And so... The pandemic kind of just reinforced that. Uh, I think it'll grow the technology. You know, if if there was bugs with Zoom, I think those will be ironed out. We'll have yeah. we'll have more competing services that do stuff like Zoom. Uh, we'll have more um, competing services for uh, like file transfer and you know webcam and like all these solutions. I think are going to come about because of this. And I think that it's going to actually take the entire marketplace from a more local thing where you go to a job and you work at a building to where you can really, you can do any job from anywhere. Right. And I, and I think right. for, for somebody like myself, it just means that like, yes, I was already kind of talking to anybody that has an internet connection and YouTube, but it just reinforces that literally the whole world is an audience like it can be an audience so if you're a band you literally can have fans of your music anywhere which is pretty incredible yeah, yeah you're absolutely right i mean youtube and zoom is the reason that this is happening in the first place you know um i i stumbled across your videos and i was like oh man this is awesome and that happened because of youtube's algorithm and they knew that <laughs> i'm looking for more content like this um this is a little i mean this is kind of like a retrospective question, but like now that you've amassed, you know, so much experimentation, gear, knowledge and know-how about recording techniques and working with clients and bands, if you could go back to like your very first project that you did, uh, e either as an, as an engineer or as a, as, an, as a producer, if you go back to that mental space you were when you did that first project, what would you change? about that first project? What was that first project? And would, would you change anything with now everything that you've amassed right now? Or were you like, oh, no, I think it's fine the way it is? That's a really good question because I, I've had that thought where, you know, what was I thinking? <laughs> like, I mean, like, we, we, we overdubbed everything, you know? Like, 
we never had two musicians playing together ever. It was just like one person playing at right. a time. And so, of course, the groove mm -hmm. suffered, you know, like I recorded music that just did not groove very well. And uh, same thing with isolation. I mean, we had um, like at that studio that we set up in my house that I referenced before, it was like we had a vocal booth, we had a guitar box, we had a even a drum booth, you know? And so we were recording drums in a drum booth. And like, you know, there's no use of uh, room mics. There was um, no experimentation because when you're in a drum booth, uh, you kind of set up your mics and you leave them alone because it's right. so tight in there and you're not gonna switch stuff out. And so yeah, like I would just kind of scratch the whole plan and be like, okay, uh, what can we do that's that's a little bit different? And and actually towards towards the very end of that studio's life, I I I had the band, they just got totally stuck. And I just had the idea of like let's just set up in my living room. And let's put like candles up and let's turn off all the lights and let's have everybody in one room and let's do I think we did like 14 takes of mm -hmm. this one song and mm -hmm. everybody kind of became um, kind of an entity together. They, they kind of gelled. And that was when stuff started to click. Like that was a glimpse of a better way because it was musicians playing together. It was even some bleed on the microphones, but who cares? Because it was such a good kind of magical moment for just that perfect take that ended up on the recordings. I, I mean, I couldn't agree more because uh, ever since we started doing these live sessions um, at, at my studio here, uh, the whole idea was basically to do like a one take live recording of a band from, I mean, from all over India. So we, we were looking at, uh, India has a very, very large Bollywood music industry. Uh, so there's not too much uh, like support for independent musicians over here in India. It's just Bollywood music. I mean, 90% or 80% of all music consumed in India is Bollywood music. So there's this behemoth of an industry that you're fighting against. And th there aren't enough platforms uh, in India to support indie music. So about two years ago, when I started the studio, I had this idea that, okay, you know what? Um, the space is there. Why don't we just call a bunch of musicians to come and just play together? And because it was all in our own time and in our own budget, uh, we decided to do it as live sessions because it was the most economical, right? We didn't want to have a five-day studio session recording drums and bass. We were like, okay, let's make this as cheap as possible. Let's do it as a live session. Not knowing the the struggles that come through a live session, right? But uh, when we started doing this, people were really digging the kind of music we were doing. And um, the, mix, the mix engineer who does a lot of our mixes, a guy called Protier, uh, he... We did exactly what you were describing. I mean, there's always bleed on the mics, especially like when we have a drummer and a vocalist uh, as well. Like the vocal mic basically becomes a room mic for the drums for the most part. <laughs> but uh, we have to use that creatively. We have to use that. We're not trying to pretend that this is a clean and you know surgical uh, vocal take with the uh, surgical drums and guitars and all. We, we like, this is how music is going to sound if you go and hear it live at any concert, at any show. So we wanted to re recreate that fundamental idea. So all the live sessions we've done right now, and we've done about 40 different artists right now, um, all of them are one take, not edited, just mix and master kind of thing. And uh, it's it's during this time that, you know, we got featured on Rolling Stone for our work and, you know, Red Bull Music were like, oh man, you guys are doing something cool. So what started off as like a, as a financial saving measure ended up being like our characteristic sound. So I completely understand. Like there, there is uh, there is merit to obviously doing them as overdubs and recording them as separate takes, but there's just something about a live recording session when the energy is right, everybody's clicking together. They're all rushing and dragging together and it sort of breathes life into it versus, you know, playing on that metronome, playing on that click. It's, uh, it's something that we really, really now like own uh, in this space over here. So I completely understand. I completely agree. 
Yeah, um, and man, your recordings sound great, man. Like they really sound good. Like it's not, it's uh, it's not like a a step down, or it's not a um, kind of a, a right. demo sound where it's like, well, right. this is a exactly. good enough sound, and it was live, so right. it'll be good enough. It's it's actually a recording where like it actually sounds, you know, top notch to where this is good enough to yeah call done you know it's it's its own yeah, that thing means a lot i mean uh, all of us over here are, good, are greatly going to appreciate that because uh, that's what we think as well you know like this is not a demo recording this is something that we have in fact then put out as compilation albums on spotify and apple music as well so uh, we think it's good enough to be considered as a live recording that can be put out on distribution platforms too so yeah, that's been going on, and we just got to keep seeing uh, what happens, and we're excited for that. Uh, as a studio owner, um, what would be like, you know, your three tips to somebody who has the space, just like you said, uh, has the willingness and the desire, just like you said, um, wants to start a studio, and what would be yeah, like your three do's and three don'ts? Well, okay, so n- number one is that the studio recording space well i guess it depends on what kind of work you want to do but let's assume you want to do a mix of recording and some mixing but your space is your most important piece of gear so the actual walls the ceiling Mm. the floor that's 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 a a piece of gear and that has a sound to it just like a microphone has a sound so that's number one is understanding that so treat it treat it as such and uh you know, add some absorption, take some away, but really see mm. it as a piece of gear. So that's number one. Mm. Uh, number two is once you have that most important piece of gear, now you focus on your mics, your preamps, whatever. Try not to do a bunch of upgrading. So get get stuff that you know you can use, even if you right. had better mics. You know, obviously, SM57s, you're probably not going to just throw those away. Like, you'll probably hold on to those. SM7Bs. Um, I just got in some M201s by Bayer Dynamic. Uh, they sound fantastic, you know? Uh, it's like two $300 microphones that are Dynamics that will always be there no matter what type of mics exactly. you get later on. You, you could mm-hmm. always hold on to these mics, and they're very respectable mics that do a fantastic job. They're just a different design, and they're cheaper. Um, and then number three on the do is definitely try to get referrals. So any band that you record is always an audition for the very next thing. So mm-hmm. um, always do your best work, you know? Like, always bring in your A game. Be polite. Uh, be courteous, pull the best out of your musicians, um, do whatever it takes. I mean, I I um, threw everybody in my living room, lit candles, you know, I totally changed my way of working at the time, uh, and that was the first time I really tried that, because it was, it was driven by the musicians, and I wanted to make sure that, like, they were impressed when they left exactly. by yeah. that, you know, like, mm-hmm. they would remember yeah. that. Yeah. And then they would go and tell their friends that you got to go, you got to go, you know, work with Ryan because we went in and this song was terrible (laughs) and we hated it. And now we love that song, you know? So that's, that's my number three for the do is work those referrals, you know, and get referrals of referrals of referrals. And, you know, you always want that, that good quality work, just do your best and try to get something, Mm -hmm. you know, referred in. Uh, friend of a friend kind of thing. Um, as far as the don'ts, um, I would say, you know, be careful of your cost. Um, so if 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 there's really no reason for you to be in a big city, then don't be in a big city. Like, go somewhere yeah. where the rent is cheap or do it in a basement or a garage. Try to find a space that is as cheap as possible so that so you don't have a high cost. Because the last yeah. thing you need is a high cost. Uh, because musicians can't, you know, they can't uh, 
pay an increase studio fee. You know, it's just not there. I, I guess it leads to number two is that you have to expect the income to come from multiple things or somewhere else entirely because um, it may not be that you get to, you know, charge two grand to record for a couple of days, you know? Um, it could be that, okay, maybe you have to, um, you know, do a live event at the studio where you allow VIP mm -hmm. fans to come in and somehow you're able to make money with that and, uh, you know, like Brian up at Weathervane, you know, like uh, they do like recording workshops, you know, they come in and talk about the process of recording and, you know, yeah, so that's my number two don't, is don't expect it to mm -hmm. just come from the musicians. I, I guess the number three would be don't go for the flavor of the month. <laughs> so if something is brand new, don't, don't completely buy into that with yeah. all mm -hmm. your money, you know? Um, mm -hmm. Like the uh, uh, Plugin Alliance just came out with this Lindell yeah, Audio, right. this API plugin, and I see it all over yeah. uh, Instagram right now. You know, it's like everybody's using it, and it's like, okay, like, is that going to be, like, d does the song actually need that plugin, yeah. or is it just something new, you know? So that creates kind of a buying thing of like you're just spending money, you know. Um, but it also kind of distracts you as far as like, okay, what is the gear that really works mm -hmm. and works well? And what's the gear that's mm -hmm. known to work? And, you know, SM7B, the M201 that I mentioned, like those are like classics that they just kind of work. And so those are the time-tested things and it can be easy to kind of get caught up in the really cool product that comes out. I mean, sure, check it out, but don't get too caught up in that, uh, the novelty mm -hmm. of something that's new. Give it some time, mm -hmm. see how it works, but always do what's right for the song when you're choosing your tools. I really like how you said that your space is your biggest gear. That's really, really good. Um, and I, I agree with you in the in sense of the, especially when it comes to plugins and VSTs, um, I think it's important to get comfortable with any DAW's stock arsenal of plugins first before, oh, you definitely need that Waves bundle or you definitely need that. I mean, well, yeah, you can amass that over time, but I think there's a there's a really steep downfall to having a bunch of plugins and then not knowing how to use any one of them really well versus having two plugins that you you know exactly how to use and how it impacts the sonic quality of of your song so yeah and for i think that's a big issue with a lot of mix engineers that it's just like you said it's the flavor of the month they just download it and they just keep on adding it but they haven't really tasted any of those flavors enough to know and describe what it does so that's a that's a really good point um my last question, I guess, is, uh, you know, what's coming up ahead? Uh, what's, what's next for, for Creative Sound Lab? What's next is, is a lot of the classic type concepts. I, I really want to um, kind of bring back like the one, two, three tutorials where I had, you know, three steps for how to do something. And it was uh, just kind of formatted a little bit differently. Um, you know, I started doing a lot of uh, kind of review type videos, and, and those were cool, but I really want to make sure that um, I, I give more effort for just, you know, diehard right. tutorials that really teach, right. you know, really teach something and, and, and are, are really rich in content. Um, I'm also experimenting with, um, you mm -hmm. know, live videos where I, mm -hmm. you know, can... Uh, do a lot more, uh, a lot more broadcasts, which are actually done live, but then also just record it live, where it's just kind of like a right. one take kind of recording, and so right. that means that I can make videos a lot faster. Um, the videos have a little bit different feel to them because they're a little bit more casual and more, I guess, mm -hmm. long winded. I guess the tighter you want a video to be on the edit, yeah. the more you have to mm -hmm. sit there and edit. 
the video. And so, like, it takes me, um, I mean, honestly, it takes me about eight hours to edit a video. And sometimes 12, you know, a fast mm. video would be like four hours. Like, that'd be a really mm. fast uh, edit. But it takes a while to sit there, make That's sure cool. that all the cuts mm. work, to make mm. sure that the that the story actually makes sense. Like, why why am I talking about this? Like, that doesn't make any sense at all. And then you have to kind of, like, rearrange it a little bit and... So that's the stuff that takes time, and I found that if you can just, again, going back to the basics mm -hmm. of like putting musicians in a room, if you can just mm -hmm. go back to the basics where you're just talking and you're saying it one time, then yeah. most likely it's going to flow, you know? You don't have to piece it together. If you just have a conversation with the camera, it'll flow. So yeah, I've been experimenting with that, different ways of making mm -hmm. content so I can do more. I've been doing a lot of um, mixing stuff, but doing it hands-on. So I've been known as kind of a recording channel, but I want to make sure that if I do mixing stuff, like it can it can be using plugins, but I want to keep it in kind of a creative sound lab kind of style. So hands-on, creativity, that kind of stuff. So I'm using lots of cameras, outboard when I can, plugins, trying to mix the worlds a bunch you know mix the world of recording and mixing and mix the worlds of yeah. mm -hmm. outboard and plugins and even mix yeah. the world of guitar pedals and outboard because one's line level yeah. one's yeah. high impedance right with the reamp box yeah. so anyways i can kind of mix those worlds you know we have like a holy grail mm -hmm. reverb on the vocal track and we have mm -hmm. a uh, a distortion pedal on the a drum mic uh, you know, like anytime I can do that, it's just a lot of fun. So, yeah, that's that's kind of what's up for uh, awesome. the future of Creative uh, Sound Lab. I mean, you guys should definitely go check out his channel. Um, a lot of uh, uh, my little aha moments in the studio have come from things that I heard uh, Ryan talk about. Um, so thank you again, Ryan, for taking the time out to do this. This was awesome. Um, I hope you had fun too. <laughs> Thanks, Rog. This is great. I mean, I'm I'm just honored to to do this. I mean, your your stuff sounds really good, and I, I'm not just saying that. Like the proof is right there in the recording. You know, it sounds great, and I'm just honored to be a part of helping you create that and helping absolutely you help other musicians. So it's been really cool to be absolutely. a part of what you're up to. Yeah, like All right. Thank you.